Okay, good morning. This is April 29th. I'm scared. I'm going to always say August. <laughs> <laughs> um, I look up at the calendar and I see A, and I go to August instead of April. So it's April 29th, um, Thursday morning. This is House Corrections and Institutions Committee. This morning, we're going to be talking with um, Jesse Beck from Freeman French Freeman that um, did it's a report on uh, options for space renovations, um, addressing space needs within the state house. Uh, the goal is to have the legislature come back into the building uh, come next January. Um, we don't know what's gonna happen with COVID. We don't know what any of the situations are gonna be. We had fully intended this past session up until about the middle of December, we had fully intended on coming back to the State House in some form. And we were on that course to do that until um, the cases of COVID really started to peak and then decided to do things virtually. Um, there are options out there and I will go through this report. I just want to remind folks this is a report. This is not a final document that these are things we're going to do. These are options that will be um, available on the table for further discussions. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Catherine Benham to give an introduction and then we'll go to Jesse Beck with Freeman French Freeman. Hi, uh, sure. I am Catherine Benham with the Joint Fiscal Office. And uh, earlier this spring, um, I went to the Joint Legislative Management Committee with a proposal um, to, to, uh, for assistance on for you all to think about how to come back um, in this new environment that is ever changing. And uh, one of the things we talked about at Joint Legislative Management is that uh, Freeman French Freeman did a study pre-COVID that came out, I believe, in January or February of 2020. And then um, the legislature hired them again to do, try to come up after COVID had started, try to figure out how you all could come back this past January. And they so Freeman French and Freeman has seen the legislature work in the old way, and they've also helped think about ways to move forward in COVID. So we did a contract with them, the Joint Legislative Management Committee approved it, and we did a contract with them to do both two things. One is to look at the medium term, sort of how do you come back relatively soon, but also think about the long term. Um, how, are you, how do you want to think about the legislative process working and being physically for the next you know, three to 10 years? Um, and so Freeman French Freeman had a relatively short turnaround time. I'll let um, Jesse walk through it, but that is the context of having support to provide some options and recommendations for somebody to think about how best to use the space and allow you all to do the work that you do. Um, with that, Jesse, I will turn it over. And Jesse Beck is here from Freeman French Freeman. And I would just say Janet Miller, the Sergeant in Arms, actually was the one who has the contract with Jesse as well. So she's been heavily involved as well. So this is really about the third study that Freeman French and Freeman has done on our space. We had, as Catherine mentioned, we've been struggling anyway with uh, some space needs within the building pre-COVID. So we had Freeman French and Freeman do a study and Catherine alluded to this, just trying to figure out, this is pre-COVID, trying to figure out how we could best change and use some of the space we currently have. Um, and then COVID came in. So we're trying to meld those two worlds, I believe at this time. So Jesse, it's all yours. If you could just introduce yourself for the record. Sure, I'm Jesse Beck, architect with Freeman French Freeman in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, Jane Pickell uh, worked very closely with me on this study and, and couldn't make today. She's actually doing another BGS, uh, BGS project. Uh, so. Um, she had a lot of input and is our interior designer and worked with me on the previous two studies as well. Uh, so this third study really builds upon the previous two. And the charge was the what to do in the medium term and how we define that is what can we accomplish to get people back in the state house for next January legislative session. Uh, the second piece of the study 
was that to do any any real change, physical changes, um, it's going to take time. And so any any really major work would take a longer term and be a long-term investment um, in about three to 10 years to accomplish. So what you'll see in the second part of the study is a recommended master plan for both adding onto the building, uh, changing mechanical systems, uh, and backfilling inside the building. Because once you build an addition and you move certain functions into that new space, you open up space within the historic structure for other functions. So that's a term called backfill renovations. So we have the medium term uh, and we have the long term. So what we did uh, to really build a foundation because COVID really did change people's uh, sensitivities, uh, their approaches, their attitudes. And so we interviewed uh, about over 30, 30 people that um, work, uh, have activities in the state house. And in our report in the executive summary, you'll, you'll find issue areas and subjects that everyone talked about and we organized those so that you could see what some of those comments and, and issue areas are. Uh, from that, we started to think about um, how we could get people back to work in the state house in full or in part, uh, and that goes to our recommendations. Uh, for the medium term recommendations, meaning what can we accomplish in eight months to get people back in January, and what would that look like? Um, our recommendation is to return the legislators and staff only into the building and provide public access through AV technology, uh, all the elements that you're doing now uh, from various locations in the state or from people's homes. Option B to that medium term is to broaden, broaden that by bringing public to the Capitol complex, but having um, hearings and committee, even committee rooms in other buildings in the state house, say 133 State Street. Uh, we have the basement and the top floor um, and possibly 109. So large gatherings would take place in larger spaces for the public. The long-term recommendation really is uh, a series of, of components, component choices that can be done over time. Um, we were targeting the growth uh, of the process, the building um, over a three to 10 year period. Uh, these components are illustrated in the report and include elements like overbuilding the cafeteria because uh, the building was structured to go up a level. Uh, seems rather logical, but it's complex to overbuild the cafeteria. So that's one of the components. Uh, another component we felt uh, would be very valuable is to have a three-story addition to the west of the building, which we're nicknaming the public house. And this would be a way to create public space on the ground floor uh, in all three levels so that people could enter um, in a controlled area. There'd be space for people to collect uh, bathrooms, uh, ADA accessible areas. Uh, there'd be a new loading dock, which is problematic right now. And then as you go up, there'd be committee rooms, uh, hearing rooms, uh, public spaces, enlarge the cafeteria seating, uh, lounges, and on the top floor, additional large committee rooms. So that's, that's another component. Uh, so you can see these components in the report. Each of the options for the medium term has a cost estimate to it, as well as a timeline. 
So on the medium term timeline, like I said, there's about eight months to, to do the elements that we're suggesting for alterations. And then there's also a cost estimate uh, for the long-term master plan and the estimate is done by components. And so there's uh, eight components to the master plan cost. And you can do one, you can do two, you can do all of them. Some of them are contingent on pieces of another one. So, you know, we can help you further refine uh, a direction uh, once you get further into the, the analysis and the recommendations. Um, in the appendix, uh, something that's, that's very interesting is we, we laid out what the ideal committee rooms should look like. And there are various sizes depending on the size of the committee, uh, the staff and people supporting that committee, and the new technology that, that needs to go into these rooms, um, and the range in size. The also, the, the study directive uh, is in here. The interview questions. So if you're curious as to what we asked the 30 people, they are listed in Appendix 3 uh, in page 47. Um, one of the short-term recommendations, that there, there's actually two. Uh, one is to do hire a, a code specialist uh, which we work with on our large scale projects to do a code review of the building. And this will help you establish uh, by area uh, the amount of, of people that can fit in the building uh, according to codes, the egress pass, the widths, the sizes um, to make sure that uh, we understand the capacities of the structure. Second, um, short-term recommendation is to move forward with the HVAC assessments and study and, and look at the aging equipment and all the various components because there is a series of, of uh, systems that, that operate this building. And as we know from the past, they have been overstressed by the occupancy levels that we've been seeing in the last five years. Um, so that's pretty much the contents and some of the recommendations out of here. And I'd be happy to go to any section of the report or answer any questions that you might have. Uh, let me, um, I'm trying to, to, I'm trying to think, um, we should look at some of the diagrams before we go into questions so people can understand some of the moving pieces. And I'm concerned because I know for half the committee, they're not aware of all the <laughs> layout of the capital of the building um, too, because we have new members, brand new members who are just elected and have not worked in the building. So it's hard to have a concept of moving things when you don't even know the current layout a lot of the building. So we do have a question. So let's start with Scott, but I'd also like to get into the diagrams, Jesse. Mm -hmm. I, I can wait if you would rather. No, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, so um, thanks for being here, Jesse. I, I uh, read the study last night and uh, it's very thorough and really appreciate it. Um, you mentioned two things that you would do, you would suggest doing right off the code review and uh, uh, HVAC analysis. Mm -hmm. One of the things that, that, that I've been curious about, and I haven't had a chance to get in the building to, to, to uh, get a uh, um, sort of walkthrough from um, anybody from BGS, but um, I, I, should, I should tell you my, my background is in, uh, in building and, and, uh, and building design and, and, and weatherization and energy efficiency stuff. So um, uh, we're not going to get into the windows. <laughs> no, I'm going to talk about moisture. Um, <laughs> well, you talked about that with the windows. Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> moisture, moisture is, is always an issue. But anyway, when, in terms of HVAC, in, in terms of HVAC, not windows, 
Um, I, one of the questions in my mind is how much of the moisture is, is, a, is moisture load coming from uh, the foundation from uh, underneath, underneath the building, which is probably right on ledge. Um, and so I'm, I'm, just, I'm just wondering about, what, about um, whether there's exposed ledge underneath in the, in the, in the uh, basement, which again, I haven't seen. Um, whether you've had a chance to see that, uh, you know, what, what, what your thoughts are on that. Sure. I mean, I mean, most of the moisture really is because there's no humidity control in the building. And it is a living museum with, with a lot of artifacts, which really does require humidity control. Now, where that moisture is coming from could be uh, from the back areas or really the ones that we've read previous reports from the past that have moisture coming in through the annex, the back of the annex. And there was mold studies and some mold that has been remediated and measured and controlled. Mm -hmm. So there has been steps to control that. Uh, I really don't know the, the, the structure back there myself. Uh, we've just done some visual walkthroughs and mainly looking at space. We haven't done an in-depth engineering study on any of this building. Okay. So Jesse, can you explain what the annex is so folks understand? Um, so the annex is the uh, the it's, it's back where drafting operations yes. is, if those of you who are familiar with that. Yeah, legal yeah. drafting. It's a long, thin addition in the back. So there's a courtyard that separates the historical structure, the, the prime historical structure. There's a courtyard, and then you get to the annex. So it's where are some of our legal staff and some of our administrative staff. It's like where Mike Ferrant is and then further back in there. And what we're proposing and recommending is that that lower level, which is, is not the greatest environment for, for people, although there are windows, uh, that we use that for other functions. Um, one side we're labeling for IT equipment. As, as you grow, you need spaces for, for equipment. And the other half we're calling a copier room, uh, which doesn't have a lot of people in it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I suppose the moisture there is, is, is coming off the hill, really a cliff right behind the building, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's, just, it's just an intense amount of mm -hmm. uh, bulk water moving there. So yeah, controlling that would seem to be one of the prime uh, issues as far as controlling the moisture load in the building generally, but anyway, um, we'll hear more about it later, I'm sure. Thanks. Karen? I apologize that I was late. Um, I was coming from an appointment, but I was listening on YouTube. So I think I have the context. I don't think this is a duplicate question. Um, just trying to understand the context that we're listening this to, because in looking at the report, I saw the proposed timeline states that, um, looking for this to be into the capital bill. Is that what we're looking? Is that the context that we're looking at this? Are we just looking at it just to see what potentially is going on? Are we looking at funding this project and figuring out how it's gonna go forward? We don't know what we're looking at at this point. Okay. We're trying to figure out um, how we move forward to get us back in the building in January. So, and what does that en encompass? And if we need language, we'd better work and figure out with other folks what that language says. Um, we also need to be realistic. What can we accomplish between now and January construction wise in the building? Um, so there's decisions that have to be made and some of those decisions are um, done th with leadership and with other folks. So we're trying to figure out the process here within the next few weeks. Uh, Catherine? Um, yes, I just wanted to let everybody know that the Senate Appropriations Committee put in um, two and a half million dollar placeholder to, to have this discussion continue. So there, and it is, I've got to look it up, but I'm pretty sure it was CRF funds, which have to be spent by December. 
which would fit and it has to be COVID related. It fits all of those requirements. So I think that will be, um, so the funds would right now be from CRF. They're in the big bill that the Senate is voting on for the next few days. And that will be, there will be a committee of conference about that. And so there will be an ongoing discussion as well. Thanks. So there's a lot of moving pieces for this. So Jesse, this may be a good time to go into some of the diagrams uh, for the short term and the long term. Uh, do you, does somebody want to call it up on your side or do you want to do a screen share and can I share it? Or? Do you need to do a screen share to move, move things along so you can... Or yeah, we can, if people have a cop, do we have there, the copies? We have all the copies. Okay, so everybody has a copy. So right. we, we might, might, maybe we should just do that. Yeah, let's do the copies. Um, well, um, page 25, I think. Yes, this is the medium term option A. So, so just this, is just, this piece here is just for legislators and staff to come back, correct, Jesse? Option A is within the state house just to limit it to legislators and staff. Um, and then provide public access through, you know, IT, AV. So um, the annex, uh, we'll start from the back and you'll see actually two levels. There's a annex mezzanine and then there's a ground level annex. So where you see the D and the E uh, is what I was referencing. E is for the IT improvements and D is for the copy areas. But how these diagrams work is there's a color code off to the right so each of the colored areas, you'll see a lot of green, bright green. Those are committee rooms. And once we, we uh, have a lot of people into a committee room, we're calling it a hearing room. So that's terminology. Um, when there's a lot of interested people uh, and it needs a larger space, we're using a committee slash hearing room. So I just want clarity on that one. Mm -hmm because our terminology is a little different. So when you say committee room slash hearing room, is it always used as a committee room or is it vacant to be used when there's large committee meetings or hearings? In this situation, we wanna turn um, those rooms into committee rooms. For so permanent we... use by committees. Yes. On a daily basis. So you're yep. taking room 10, room mm -hmm. 11, the mm -hmm. coat room and the lounge mm -hmm. and making those all permanent committee rooms. Correct. And does that mean they'd be for Senate? Because that's where the Senate committees meet is on the first floor. They'd be for house committee rooms. We have not assigned committees. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> that's the bottom floor mm -hmm. is for the Senate usually. Yep. So personally, I would have concerns mixing the committee rooms with House, House committee rooms down there along with Senate committee rooms, but that's just me. Mm -hmm. And the other issue here, you're taking two big rooms away mm -hmm. that are caucus rooms or hearing rooms and the lounge at yep. this point. Mm -hmm. With those... For this, yeah. do you see that as permanent changes or just temporary in order to get us back to the building? This is uh, for the medium term to get you back into the building. So they would be temporary, the yep. changes. Okay. So that's important to, to know. Yes, as long as you choose to do uh, the part of the master plan so that you can return these back to a different use. Mm -hmm. So we have a question here, Kurt. A uh, couple of questions. Well, first one for you, Madam Chair. What's the concern about having House committees on the floor, on the first floor? Is there a reason for that? I think it's more psychological. You know, the Senate, the Senate is more confined. Um, 
and they operate down there, you know, senators are moving a lot down there in the hallways and between committee rooms. It's really their, the way they function, just like we function in our hallways and the hallway upstairs. Um, so there tends to be a separation there between the two bodies for their, their work. Oh, they, come, I see. Okay. they come together in the cafeteria. We come together when we have joint meetings in room 10 and 11. They have their own separate chamber. We have our own separate chamber. So it's, it's the mechanics and the functioning of the two bodies. So it, it could be that the legislative lounge could be house because that's kind of separated from the other three that might be, but. But remember I'm this not, is temporary. This yeah. is a way to get us back into the building. This is not permanent. That's why yeah. I asked that question. Okay, my, my other question um, for Mr. Beck is the where uh, with the coat room in the back there, I believe, uh, relocated, where would the public primarily be coming in? Would they be coming in the front and side doors as usual, or would they be coming in over there where there's a K or? Yeah, I think I think we're we're designating the K areas where the public would enter the building. And but this is also the option A, so really the public wouldn't be coming in too much, or is option A? Yeah, you're right. Yep. Oh, okay. Yes, you're right. P public wouldn't be coming in, but that's where your your health station is right now. Your temperature check, uh, secure entrance that that we've been using, and that's pretty much um, where you know we, we need to control and do health checks, even though it might be a post-COVID world. So um, that would be the entrance. So okay, just, good, thank you. I'm just trying to get the layout of this. So you come in through the loading dock. Mm -hmm. and yep. Then you take a right. So where it's B, is that, would it be the copy room and the Capitol Police room combined? Yes, that, that's the new coat room. So you take the wall down between the Capitol Police room and the copy room. Yes. And then where Senate Ag is, which is across the hallway, where's that dark, where C is, mm -hmm. you would move the Capitol Police there. Yes. Does that have to be done for us to come back to do that kind of renovation there? Uh, Madam Chair. In my opinion, because now that we don't have room nine as a coat room, I we have to have something happen on any any way we come back in January. In my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yep, I, I would recommend that. So this is contingent on moving out Ledge Council <clears throat> folks, the Mike Grant folks. This is contingent on moving them out somewhere. That would be moving Mike upstairs, Mike Ferrant and his group. So that would be payroll and those folks would move upstairs of the, where Luke Martland's offices are now. And what would you do with folks who are in those offices? Um, just, I think in one of the the scenarios is we do own the right now the 133 fifth floor so those attorneys would go there the fifth floor right well, one thing to look at is page 11 in the report uh, page 11 really lays out um, each staff area or department where they currently are located where would they, they would go in the medium term and where they would go in the long term. So there's, there's quite a list um, designating uh, each of those groups right down to the pages and kitchen staff. And um, so that, that's a real important section is on page 11 and 12, uh, something to take a close look at. So that would be just on the first floor. 
So there would need to be movement just so we can recap this. Where our legal staff is, some of our legal, our lawyers on the mezzanine would be moved out of there to someplace on 133 State Street is the thinking. And what is currently the Mike Ferrant and administrative staff and proofreading on that very bottom floor would be moved up to the mezzanine. Mm -hmm. um, and then where the uh, ledge council is right now on the bottom floor, you would have um, way in the back there would be the IT equipment and where Mike Harant is now would be the copy room. Correct. And I see a little G there on the mezzanine for pages. Mm -hmm. Is that for our legislative pages? Yes. Is that what that's for? Because they were operating out of a closet in, uh, <laughs> coat room. in the old coat room. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Scott and then Kurt. Kevin also has his hand up, so. Yeah, his just went up. Okay, Scott, Kurt. Hi, um, yes, the, there are walls shown on this, on, on page 25 that um, that aren't there. It isn't, uh, is there, does this include some proposal to build walls? So I, I'm, I'm looking at, uh, oh, above, the room 11. Um, Are you on the second floor? Well, it, no, I'm on, it's on the first floor. Um, maybe these are supposed to show walls from upstairs or something. I, I don't I'm, I, anyway, well, I'm treat, treat these as diagrams. They're, they're not architectural documents per se. Oh. So they're, they're just illustrating concepts, not details. Right, right. No, I understand. Um, but Anyway, uh, I just wonder what, what the significance of, the, of these of these wall uh, of these walls are. Which page are you on? This is page twenty-five, right in the middle of the page. Um, uh, the, the, so the courtyard between room eleven and and uh, and where the Capitol Police and coffee yeah. room are now. Well, that's the machine room, I think, Jesse. Yeah. That he's. Mm -hmm. There's a room in there that you don't even know about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's under the stairs. Yep, that's machine room right there. It's all mechanics. <laughs> okay. You don't even see it. <gasps> Never knew about it. Yeah, there's a right. lot of places in the state house that are pretty well hidden yeah. <laughs> for I'd mechanics and that type of thing. I'd love to see them. Um, yeah, my, the other sort of concern I have is about the turning these two large rooms, the lounge and room 11 into single committee rooms just seems like the committee is gonna get lost in those rooms. Um, it, it just seems like, a, I don't know, I, I, I realize this is very difficult to find space for everybody to, to, to move around in, um, but anyway. Well, the question is, work, so. the question is, is what spacing do we need? Three feet from each other or six? That's yeah. the issue. Yeah. That's the issue. Um, and when we looked at it last time with Freeman, French and Freeman, you may think it's a six foot apart from each other, but when you encompass your elbows and everything, you're really doing a circle of seven feet. Right. So if we do three feet apart, you're really more three and a half or four feet. And we've got 11 folks on our committees. Right. So you've got to spread those folks out. Yep. That's the key. Yeah, I understand. And I look back at the um, August study as well. Um, so anyway, w w let's move on. <laughs> yeah, the legislative lounge right now is set up, um, which is interesting. We went in and saw the, the setup. Um, and it doesn't feel like you're lost in there. It, it's, it is a big room, but it's comfortable. Oh, it, no, it is for as it's, as it's set up now. Yes, absolutely. Um, but I'm just thinking about committee rooms, or rather committee sitting around a table. Um, and I, you get into that somewhere in the report also about whether 
sitting around the table is 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 the, is is the best idea or 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 a, more of a hearing kind of setup. Uh, I think in one of the appendix appendices. Mm -hmm. um, but sitting around a table seems like a really important uh, feature of committees working together, uh, you know, across the mm -hmm. political spectrum, you might say. Yep, All I right. agree Thanks. with that. Hearings are a little different because now when we do have hearings in room 11 and room 10, you do sit, all the members sit up in a line at the head. Right. The audience is there. But in committee rooms, I agree with Scott. I mean, the beauty of our legislative body, we sit around a, a table, individual desk, but it's around a table where you work as a committee and as a unit. And that's really important. Yeah. Not be lined up because you have to see everybody. Right. Uh, Kurt, and then we'll go to you, Kevin, okay? Uh, first, a quick question. Um, Mr. Beck, when you, you just said that there was a committee room that was set up, is that the... The lounge, do you mean that's set up as a as a kind of a mock committee room at this point? Yep. It was, I can take that, Madam Chair, only because that was set up regarding the COVID situation that we were uncertain how we were even coming back this January, this the session that we're in right now. So those okay. third desks in there, all six feet apart, Kevin has done all the IT infrastructure to make that possible. So, uh, so we could drop by if we wanted some time, perhaps, and see what what the committee room would look like if it were if that were just designated as a committee room. Sure. Yes. Temporary. It's temporary, folks. Yeah. yeah I thought this is all option A is temporary. Yeah. Um, okay. My uh, oh, my other question is what uh, for Mr. Beck? What what assumptions did you um, make regarding distances and uh, preventative measures that, uh, with regard to the various rooms and the chambers in terms of distances and uh, barriers and things like that for this option? Um, we did not set a standard because it's, it's left to be determined by governor's orders. Uh, our understanding is after post July 4th, uh, those restrictions are going to be adjusted or removed um, and it's up to individuals and entities to decide what they're comfortable with. So those, okay. those policies have to be established by, I guess, your governing bodies. Okay, thanks. Um, Kevin? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, Kevin Moore, Director of IT. Uh, just a couple points of clarification. I didn't want them to be lost in the uh, depth of, of this uh, discussion. Um, uh, option D on the first floor would include more than just the copy room. It would include the IT help desk as well uh, and to uh, allow for better service to be provided in that space. Wait a minute. Uh, so wait a minute. You're in option B? No, no. Uh, excuse okay. me. Uh, letter D and option A. Oh, okay where okay. Mike Ferrant and his yeah. uh, team are currently located. If the copy room was relocated to that space, it would also include the IT help desk uh, in that location. Uh, so it, it's a very much a service oriented location rather than a stowed away copy room as what we currently have uh, in hard to find IT help desk locations such as the lounge and you know further back in that space. Um, I just didn't want that to get lost in the shuffle. And then talking about the legislative lounge in its current state, not its former state, but its current state, it is very much set up in a very temporary uh, hybrid mode uh, from our uh, previous discussions. It is not what I would suggest or recommend uh, stay or remain in its current form if we were to return a committee to that space full time. There are camera angle issues that are a challenge there. Uh, there are sound quality issues there, and we probably want to augment uh, the equipment we currently have, expand it uh, to make sure that we provide a high quality um, uh, stream uh, for public interaction. So for folks who were here last year and the year before, maybe the little bit the year before, our sound system. And what we do with replacing our microphone and sound system in the well of the house may change now in terms of our backbone and what we decide to do because there's more 
uh, IT and more electronic um, transmission with cameras that may be required. So then that ties into what do we do with our sound system because it's the backbone to the sound system that can carry some of these needs for IT. Am I off base on that one, Kevin? Or is that all linked together? It's very much linked together in the long term, I would say, not necessarily the medium term, Madam Chair. Um, but it would certainly uh, um, be a good idea to revisit the K2 study that was presented to your committee uh, a couple of years back now. Um, that was a, a substantial and comprehensive uh, recommendation, set of recommendations. They are not construction documents, um, so we would still have some work to do there, uh, but it's certainly worth reviewing. Uh, Scott? That leads to another question about the house being able to meet in the house chamber, um, which we haven't even talked no, about. That's next. We got, we're only on the first floor here. Right, okay. I know. Yeah, but I mean, this, 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 this whole document is really about how to fit committee rooms in. We haven't talked about how the entire uh, chamber is going to meet. So uh, Becky, and look at Becky and Jesse <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> looking at this. <laughs> Um, first floor in the mezzanine. Was there any thinking about the current Senate rooms? We didn't, you didn't look into any of the standards for um, required spacing of individuals. So you've just left those Senate committee rooms as is. Mm -hmm. But if we get into space requirements and distancing from each other, we'll impact those Senate committee rooms. Then you have to fall back on our prior report. Which is using part of 133 State Street, and using part of the connector between the Supreme Court and the mm -hmm. pavilion. Yes. And, and some of the Senate committee rooms might have to move into House committee rooms in some ways. Mm -hmm. OK. Lots of decisions that need to be made that are beyond our committee. This is where leadership really needs to figure out some of these moving pieces. Uh, Marsha? Yeah, so with this, uh, where the coat room is, would uh, Senate Ag get their room? Yes. <laughs> well, they're going to get lost in that space. <laughs> I don't think that's a total decision that's been made. I'll just put that out there. Okay, thanks. You know, I'm not in Senate Ag, that tiny room is very small for them. But I think it's going to be up to leadership and the other people to decide who goes where. I don't think that I certainly don't want to make that decision. <laughs> you could put Senate Ag in the new coat room and keep room nine as the coat room. Because <laughs> that would be bigger. I mean, there's a lot of moving pieces here. Right. Um, so that's the first floor. And let's get up to the second floor. This is the well and the committee rooms. So here the idea is to um, remove a wall where the letter B is, and A, remove two walls. Uh, to try to make larger committee rooms. And with, I don't think, you know, our, our previous study and the um, deficiencies were about spaces being too small for the number of occupants and the pressures that both public lobbyists and, and people moving through the building were putting on the building to, uh, to, to stress them out. Um, so this is a small area uh, that by removing a couple of walls, you can enlarge those spaces to be a, a better functioning committee space. Jesse, did you look to see if any of those walls are load bearing? Uh, we did not do a structural analysis, but uh, you can easily take a wall down and it still could be a structural wall. You just have to put a header across the opening not to carry those loads. So uh, we're, we're pretty confident that this can be done. It was actually part of studies uh, prior to us about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's nothing new. It's not a new concept. So 
for B, that would mean it's our committee room and it would be the wall between education and our committee that would be torn down. That would be one committee room. Commerce committee is room 35. Across the hall from us is where ag is in the middle. Ag would be gone and you'd extend House Judiciary and House Ways and Means. And ag would be gone. We, we would probably be gone unless we could move into room 35 because that's a bigger room than what we have now. And we don't have the people that Commerce Committee has. I think we should be in that new room by the cafeteria. There's nice windows there. Yes. So that C is the back of the cafeteria. Is that a movable wall or is that permanent there? So we did a study and a proposal via BGS. Was it BGS or you? Yeah, I think it was BGS to convert that raised area in the cafeteria to a committee room. And uh, it's primarily with, with glass uh, and it could be opened up when it needed to be used for the entire cafeteria or it could be closed for a committee room. So when we were thinking it was not a committee room per se, where you'd have your daily committee meetings, it would be an extra hearing room. Because you can't take any more seating away from the cafeteria. So that's why it would not be a day-to-day -day committee room because you need seating in that cafeteria. But the idea uh, is that temporarily it could be relabeled a committee room. Uh, hopefully there's less stress in the cafeteria because there's no public, no lobbyists, not a lot of extra people, <laughs> public that needs but, to be in the building. Right, and, but we did allow for this to occur in last year's capital bill for flexible use of that. It wasn't, we allowed that, we put money in for the upper level there in the back of the cafeteria to be used for an extra hearing room, but be make sure it's available uh, for cafeteria seating. That could also mean if you wanted um, a committee, um, ad hoc committee, or maybe a caucus to meet at lunchtime and bring your lunch, that section could also be used for that. So there'd be flexible use. And we did, we did put in money to start doing that in last year's capital bill. And then the third floor would be about the same thing where B on the third floor is where um, healthcare committee is so you tear down the wall between healthcare committee and transportation. You would keep room 48, which is GovOps. Across the hall, you would remove general housing and military. So you would extend the appropriations committee room that's on the right and human services committee room, which is on the left. So the thinking is those committees that we lose would move downstairs to the lounge room 10, room nine and room 11 and the back of the cafeteria, correct? Yeah, we, we make sure that we had we had the appropriate count of total committee rooms as to who goes where is, is left to be decided. <laughs> Good call, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> to mediate. <laughs> So, so if, yeah, you tear, that, if you tear down a wall, that's pretty permanent. Yeah. Uh, Scott? And then Sarah. Um, so I was just going to observe that, I think it's House Natural Resources has been meeting in the Ethan Allen room. So they're, they're already in a different place. Mm -hmm. um, I like the idea of, of uh, making three committee rooms into two. And I wonder about doing it on both 
the both sides of the hallway there, whether that wouldn't be a, I, I don't know, it was, I'm sure it, you know it takes time to do that, but I, I, so irrespective of the time, I wonder if it wouldn't be a good idea sort of long-term because it makes those rooms more, uh, more like the size we want, we want to wind up with in the long term anyway. But the interim piece to that. Sorry? The interim piece to that yes. is we're, when we come back under normal circumstances, which could be in 2023, where are you going to put those four committee rooms? Or no, no, I understand. I, I, it, it doesn't solve it. It doesn't help any with those problems, but it just makes so, so there's those B uh, committee rooms are, are, are rather on the large side compared to the sort of normal committee room of around, you know, 450 square feet or so. But the Whatever. question is you're displacing in the interim for temporary COVID world where you don't have a lot of people in the building, you're able to displace those committees, four or five committees that you're displacing. Right, no, no, I, I and think it's- the following more... year you come back and you haven't done construction elsewhere, where are you going to put them? Right. No, I, yeah. And I, but I, I, yeah, it's really more a matter of whether there's time to do that construction or, or the will to do it and the money to do it and where the construction will be and what it will look like. Just making an observation about the long term. That's all. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Sarah? Yeah. Did Mr. Beck want to re? Well, I was just going to bring your attention to page um, page thirty and thirty one lists this option A, uh, the physical changes with the cost of the physical changes, uh, as well as option B layers in. Uh, those spaces outside of the state house with the costs. And then right across the page on 31 uh, shows you the timeline for decision making and documents, bidding, and implementation. Let's finish up A before we go to option B. Uh, Sarah? Oh, I'm, I'm just curious. I know, uh, I think this is so helpful to, to visualize and all these moving parts. Um, I am have a question about um, technology, could, since the public won't be in. I'm just trying to imagine that is, are we, am I with these rooms? Is, that might be a question for Kevin. Is it as simple as we're going to be outfitting the rooms with um, screen, you know, so, so witnesses and can zoom in and we can have them on the screen or what is that going to look like or require? Um, thank you for the question. Uh, so a lot still to be determined based off of the decisions uh, yet to be made, uh, the size of the spaces, uh, whether or not public can uh, attend or not. Um, the general concept would be to provide some sort of zoom type uh, of technology um, we're not settled where we want to be on that. Obviously, we're using Zoom right now, and it works pretty well. Um, but we want to make sure that if we are sitting around a table, for example, that we have a 360-degree camera or multiple 360-degree cameras, uh, as opposed to a single point of view, which creates view issues, which creates sound issues. Uh, it's hard to, to see who's speaking, actively speaking at any given point. There are a lot of challenges that we'd have to come up with. Uh, come up with solutions for. In addition, we'd want to put more than just a projector and a whiteboard in each space. We'd want some sort of video wall, maybe a mobile um, a screen to supplement, depending on how that room's configured at any given point. There are a, lo a lot of components that we have to uh, take into consideration, depending on what the layout and the space looks like. You know, that's, that's, I can imagine, because our schools have had to do things like this and some of them are work better than others you know it's it's actually not ideal so i've i've experienced that a little bit um and so is that factored into the cost here like in these scenarios the tech the tech is definitely in here yes uh, so it is certainly an estimate at this point um but we would be leveraging contractors um and some uh av professionals in order to really uh help us define the construction uh documents and the integration uh, it's just, it's a bit beyond the scope of our, our current capacity of our department. 
to get that detailed and make sure that we're providing that high quality uh, stream to folks. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there's a lot line item in the estimate on page 30 where you can see that. 540,000. Mm -hmm. uh, Kurt and then Scott, and then I wanna move on to option B. Okay, uh, Kevin, how does a 360 degree camera work? What do you see when you're looking at the projected 360 degree camera? Um, so it, I'll use one particular camera uh, as a uh, um, discussion point right now. So if you look up Owl Labs um, on uh, Google, just a quick Google search, Owl Labs 360 degree camera. It's a, uh, it's a nice compact unit. Um, it's about $1,500 per camera, and it's actually got some integrated technology in it to allow it to target people sitting around a table and shift uh, depending on where the sound's coming from. So you don't usually see more than two or three people at a time just for screen real estate uh, purposes, um, but it allows it to automatically and dynamically shift to whoever's speaking at, um, at that moment. Ah, I see. There, there's okay. a couple Thank of good you. demonstrations, a, good, a couple of good videos on there on that website. Good, I can look it up, thanks. Scott? Yeah, I'm just wondering, Kevin, also about, it seems like we need to be planning for this or starting to, to implement this really, um, kind of regardless of what happens because the public is going to expect access to hearings online, um, you know, since we've been doing this, it's, it seems like we're gonna have to do this anyway. So I guess I'm just wondering, now, I realize that we're, we're still in session and, and you all are still, you know, full time working on that. But uh, are, are you sort of are you getting ready to to, to uh, make some decisions and get and get started come come June? Um, so if I'm understanding your question correctly, um, uh, Representative Campbell, are you talking about just the short term concept here? Or are you talking the long, long range, big picture? Well, both. Um, it, it, it seems like. It seems like we're going to need uh, long term. We're going to need a lot more IT, a lot more, yes. a lot more you know, AV um, in committee rooms. Uh, and so, I mean, I guess, I guess, short term, I would imagine, you know, whatever you got to do for running wires, you know, um, tack to the wall or something, <laughs> you, you might have to do that. But you know, um, but then long term, what we would have the equipment. Um, you know the, the the screens and the and these cameras and in uh, in order to be able to uh, be able to conduct uh, committee meetings in person and and online simultaneously. Um, so uh, stop me if you have a question at any point here, um, and, and I'll try to do my best to uh, to kind of bring the big vision together. Um, I'm not sure if anybody is familiar with the uh, live stream capacity of the U.S. House. Uh, if you go to, uh, I think it's live or house.congress.gov or live.house.gov, um, I can circulate it to the committee shortly. Um, they actually have a highly integrated system uh, that is in use throughout many uh, legislative bodies in the country. Um, I'll refer to it commonly as what we call an e-government platform. Um, it's more than just live streaming. It's bringing the agenda, it's bringing the navigation of the uh, documentation uh, in a live capacity and an archived capacity uh, to uh, the viewers, whether that is uh, the media, constituents, um, lobbyists, whoever. Um, it's a significant investment in equipment. It's a significant investment in technology, uh, both software uh, and, and as I said, hardware. Um, but really kind of, kind of uh, taking all the components we currently have with a legislative bill tracking system, making those live, making it integrated with the, the live streams of committee um, and, and providing that in a comprehensive manner to the public. Um, it would be hosted somewhere other than YouTube. Uh, YouTube's not a forever platform. It would largely use a different streaming uh, technology, not Zoom. Zoom is not a forever platform. Um, in the short term, yes, we would likely be using paper clips and bubble gum just to make it happen. Um, uh, but the long term vision would be a highly integrated, high quality, uh, high definition system uh, that has archived storage capabilities along with live streaming capabilities. Okay, great. Well, I'm sure you're thinking along those terms, but I guess I'm just I'm just hoping that we're getting something together for for next session and and and, and 2023. 
depending on the decisions to be made long term, we certainly would come with recommendations. Yep. Great. Thanks. But Thank I you. want to be clear to folks, IT doesn't make that final decision. It's going to be leadership and legislators that make that decision. IT is on hold waiting for our decisions. Kevin can't unilaterally just go out and do it. So, so let's go to option B, which builds on option A. Option B would have us coming back, but we'd also be allow us and staff would come back, but it would also allow some limited public to come back and lobbyists or just public. Yep. Well, Both. depends how you define public. Yeah, we, okay. we use it loosely, but yes, okay. press, lobbyist, public, any interested party. Okay. And Primarily the pages 28 and 29 are, are showing uh, the two buildings uh, under study 133 states, which we've already have secured the basement and the fifth floor. Um, again, some of those rooms have been set up. You can see a picture, a couple pictures of how they were temporarily set up to illustrate uh, COVID spacing which came out of our second report on how to return under COVID rules. So the picture there on the fifth floor committee room, has that already been set up? Because I heard, my understanding was there was no fit up on the fifth floor. Is there no, there, that's, that is, there are it, tables there. That's an actual picture of it. Yeah. It's not as fine tuned as we would like because you know, we kind of put it on hold till right. you folks made a decision. So the basement of 133 would have three meeting rooms, which could be committee rooms, if we come back, correct? Correct. And then on the first floor of 133, so if you go in the side door of 133, and you go down the stairs, that brings you to the basement. Mm -hmm. Correct. And if you go up one floor, that's your first floor. The folks who have been in that building. So the first floor, you see IT space to be converted to legislative use. Is there IT there right now? In that light blue lavender? Yeah, that Kevin might do a better job explaining it, but there is a space currently being occupied by servers, and then there's another open space that would be perfect for the state house IT server space. So would there be IT staff there at all or is it just equipment? Um, so as it's currently set up, Madam Chair, uh, it's not appropriate for staff to be there. We'd have some OSHA violations pretty quickly due to sound and uh, climate control. Um, it is set up currently as a data center. Um, it is primarily in use by the Agency of Digital Services. So uh, I don't wanna speak on what they have there. I can't speak to what they have there. Uh, we do have a very small presence in that space that we acquired over the last year in order to facilitate the potential um, hybrid options uh, uh, during this past session. And then the fifth floor is where that large meeting room, committee room is that's pictured there. So you pick up three four committee rooms there. Mm -hmm. And then let's flip it and go to 109 state. This is the plan that we were under last year in, in October, November, December to get us back in January. Mm -hmm. 109 state is the connector between the Supreme Court and the pavilion. So Becky, we would pick up a committee room there with Snelling room? Not, not necessarily no. um, that, I don't, Jesse, was the Snelling room in your count of 26? Don't. I'd have to check that, I don't I think it was. Don't think it was, yeah. I think it's just an option that's, that the public can go there. Mm -hmm. And then what about the auditorium? 
You're just highlighting that? Yeah, I think these are public spaces that people could come to to uh, uh, to monitor what's going on in other places in the state house. Overflow rooms or like if we had IT overflow, perhaps. Would we just Alice, just an FYI for the new people, when they see that auditorium, that's where the governor gives his speeches from. Mm -hmm. um, I am assuming that we would not be having like school groups coming in or, um, you know, we always have different organizations or groups setting up in the cafeteria or Cedar Creek room those would not be occurring under option B? You know, that's, that's something that needs to be determined. I, you know, I, I just would kind of like to point out to the committee that the HVAC problems we've had in the state house are pre-COVID. So all those things still need to be addressed. And for best practices, as Jesse was talking about, a code analysis would, would give us a little bit, uh, not a little bit, a lot of knowledge of what's acceptable in a space like this now. Questions? So Scott brought up the issue. And if we come back in the medium term, whether it's option A or option B, Scott brought up where do we meet in the well of the house? but you can't put 150 people with social distancing in the well. You, well, you can put half right the members. Now, well, right now it holds 70. Right. But we don't know what executive orders or capacity limits or COVID pandemic issues, what will be in January. I think that's kind of the, kind of the question. Everybody's got to keep themselves flexible. Uh, right now it holds 70 with the, you know, the distancing. Um, in the Senate chamber, they have put acrylic panels that kind of rest on the uh, gallery little wall that's behind the last group of members where they sit, like say behind uh, Representative McCoy, you know, that area. Mm -hmm. So that could keep a little bit of the, um, you know, the little bit of the airflow or whatever from mm -hmm. people, but that's another thing that has to be decided. So Janet, when you say the current well will hold 70, is that 70 sitting at the, our seats? I mean, that's not everywhere. Home. That's the Senate that seats, the gallery, the, the balcony. The gallery, everywhere, the whole. So you've got another 70 plus that you've got to put someplace else. If, if we were still under yes. the six, seven foot restriction. Okay. Yeah. And where would the Senate meet? Would they have to meet in the well? They can, that room can hold 27 now under okay. present COVID requirements. Okay. In present COVID requirements, are you saying that's six feet or three? Six. six. Or as we did it, it's kind of seven from the core of your body to the core right. of the next person. Yeah. Uh, Sarah? Well, I'm just curious. I mean, schools have recently changed to three feet and, um, and that's, you know, that's, under the current guidelines. And I'm just thinking, um, I have kids in school and in universities and it's really changing. And the other piece that I'm wondering, and I don't think it's our committee's decision, um, but there, you know, colleges are gonna be in the fall are gonna be requiring that everybody's back. <laughs> and um, so that they can actually meet in classrooms together. And I'm just wondering in the, I know that's not our committee's decision and I know it's a touchy issue, but I'm just wondering if that topic has come up in the legislative management committee about, about uh, vaccine, you know, vaccination. Requiring all members yeah. in the public to be vaccinated if we come well, back. Well, I'm just really, my, I wanna be specific. I'm just looking at legislators and staff, not the public in this model is not, um, is limited coming into the building. So I, I just was curious if that's even been addressed. Not, not that I'm aware. I've kind of kind of 
have kept track and as far as I've seen, and maybe Catherine can weigh in, I haven't seen any uh, discussion about that. Yeah, because I noticed in the in the report there are a couple of policy decisions about um, that have to probably be made in um, in consort with this plan, with any plan that we that we make. And I just was, I, I wonder if that's something because I know that schools, you know, colleges and universities, they're private, um, uh, so they can make those decisions, which is different than our public schools, for sure. Um, so I just don't know where we would fall in that. But it's it'll it's allowing universities and colleges to think about having classes in person again and not being six feet away from each other. So it seems like that should factor in somehow. Mm -hmm. Do you want to weigh in on that at all, Catherine? I mean, I no, I just I know that the 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 issue of vaccinations is certainly on people's minds. I, I don't think any discussion of pattern decisions have been made at all. I think people are aware that there are people who uh, strongly on both sides of it. So that's um, and then there are people who, for other you know medical reasons, may not get vaccinations also. So it is not a simple conversation, as I'm sure you know. It's a delicate conversation. Uh, Michelle? Yeah, I have a question. Um, I know when we were considering opening this year, there was a possibility of a hybrid model. Is that what we're talking about in terms of next year? So perhaps if we had individuals who weren't able to get the vaccine or who were particularly susceptible, they could be online while those of us who were able to would be able to go in person? Because I haven't heard that mentioned recently, and I'm just wondering if there's any new news on that topic. I think that's still part of the decision making too, because rules may have to, and Madam Chair, you might weigh in on this, rules would have to be changed of who could vote from where, you know, at post pandemic. Mm -hmm. So I think those decisions are, what, that's one of those other things that need to be decided, but very good point though. One of those layers. Uh, Linda, then Michael. Um, thank you. I was going to say, you know, the comparison to schools is entirely not really relevant to what's going on in the state house. Schools are under different guidelines, private employers, et cetera. They can do mandates for their employment requirements, which is an entirely different animal than what we are. And to mandate people to be vaccinated, you're going to run into a lot of constitutional issues. So the discussion is entirely not correlated here. So I think we have to focus on who we are, the elected body in the people's house. Uh, Michael? And I was just going to simply say, I think we've touched on it a little bit, but if the governor lifts the emergency order, I think that completely changes the landscape for us. And me personally, if, if he did that, which signals to the, the public in Vermont that you can kind of go about doing business as normal, more or less. I, I think so should we, and we should look heavily at that, but that's my two cents. Thank you. So that's option B for the midterm. And that would be a way to get us back into the building. There's conversations happening, I'm sure, but, and I don't know where the final decisions are gonna lie. I don't know if it's within just leadership of both bodies. I don't know if the joint management committee will get involved in this uh, joint rules. Joint rules is made up of House and Senate leadership and some members at large. So this was presented to the joint management committee this past Tuesday morning. Um, I was present at that meeting because I felt institutions committee in the house needed a presence in there. Um, and then they dealt with other issues after this and I left before those other issues. But Catherine, was there any, or Janet, was there anything at the end of that meeting in terms of a follow-up meeting on this? Cause usually they meet the last Tuesday of the month. No, the meeting, they have tentatively scheduled every weekday, every Tuesday at eight. I don't have an agenda yet for next week, but they, we, we all hold that time, eight to nine on Tuesdays. Was the thinking they would talk about this particular issue? I didn't hear, I didn't stay for, Janet, did you hear? I, I left when you left, Madam Chair. I think it's just an ongoing discussion they're gonna come back to. 
I don't think they left it in any particular place. Anything else on option B, midterm? So let's quickly go. I know it's 1030 unless people want to take a break. Do people want to take a quick break before we get into the long term? I'm not hearing anything. Marsha, if you need a break, take a personal break. We'll leave I it. just have one question. What, whatever we, uh, I don't know who makes the decision or not, but if by the agenda, the schedule they got going, we can't be waiting too much longer to, for somebody to be making some decisions. That's the concern. I know, and I guess flip, you know, from here to there, nothing's done, done. And we gotta, somebody's gotta decide when done stops and go, goes. Well, we also need to involve BGS because BGS is the one that will be doing the construction. Yeah. Not to bid. So we will be talking with them at some point um, for that because. Because that first of May date's coming around pretty quick. Yep. It's, yep. So let's move on. Long-term recommends, we have a master plan there. The best page probably to look at first is page 35. It's a color diagram uh, showing some of the components. Would you like me to walk you through the components? Yes, yes please. Um, so you see a color diagram illustrating the, the physical additions and changes to the site. Um, I mentioned that uh, component one is the overbuild of the cafeteria, which uh, originally was structured to do this, but there is mechanical equipment on top of that roof that has to be relocated. So uh, component one uh, is the, uh, building on top of the annex in the cafeteria. Component two is the idea of a public house, a uh, three-story building linked back, interconnected to uh, the cafeteria. And it really opens up the possibilities to have all the public flow through one open space uh, designated for gathering, collecting, uh, safety, security, uh, public bathrooms, staircases, and in the back there would be a loading dock. Because right now you have a situation where you have a parking lot that's used as a loading dock and the two don't go very well together. <laughs> <laughs> so um, component three is that loading dock, uh, a roadway, uh, feeding the loading dock with an enhancement to the parking areas to the west of one Baldwin Street. Uh, another component, uh, which is labeled five, is uh, a possible addition to the Pink Lady to connect and add a two-story office space interconnected with the public house. And then component four, is a three-story component on the east side of the cafeteria building uh, to, to close off the courtyard, have another controlled entry from the east because there's a lot of parking to the east um, with some outdoor deck and uh, um, providing that entryway to the east, formal entryway. Components that, that aren't shown, but are, are listed in the narrative and also the cost estimate. Um, there's a technology allowance component because all of this requires technology. And also component seven is a mechanical electrical plumbing allowance component uh, to replace, enhance the existing systems. And then of course, uh, we need to have a placeholder for um, hazardous materials abatement in old historic buildings and soils in Montpelier. You're bound to run into something. So uh, that's really illustrated in the cost estimate section 
listing the components in their relative construction costs. So that's page 35. If we flip over to uh, so 30. Becky, Jesse, before, mm -hmm. I'm going to call you Becky. I'm sorry. So Jesse, um, I have a question of clarification on component four. Mm -hmm. That closes in the courtyard, which is that little L there with the blue. And then you're building a floor on top of the speaker's office? Uh, no. The blue... The whole blue area, there's nothing built there right now. So that's from the ground up. Well, you're going to dig into the ledge or you're going to? Yeah, it'll be stepped into the ledge. OK. And are you filling in that courtyard that's there? We, we're not. not. Um, well, I probably saying closing the courtyard was the wrong term. You can't walk directly into the courtyard like you do now. OK. So there'll be a lobby, there'll be a secure lobby there. So you have to go through a secure lobby and then you can walk into the open air courtyard. It's similar to what we did in the Waterbury State Office Complex. We, we had a new building and links to the historic core and left that open area in the middle so people could mm -hmm. come outside, get a breath of fresh air and sunshine without having to leave a secure zone. Yes, okay, got it. So that gray, that grayed in box in the middle is that open courtyard that exists right now. Okay. Kurt? Yes, how many floors is component four? Uh, component four is three. So it'd be three stories high? Yes. Okay, thank you. That's so that the, the cafeteria level can expand out and this new overbuild in component one would be that third level. And then, and you don't lose any parking because you're, you're gonna go up more up into the bank. On the east side, correct. You would not okay. lose any parking. You have a little stream that comes down there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You do have a stream there. Okay, next. So if you flip over to 36, 37, you can start to see how uh, these spaces and components are being used in concept. Uh, so again, you have the color coding system on the lower right uh, to go with the color boxes in the diagrams. Uh, you also can see on the lower left, there's a list of new construction square footages and what can go in there is labeled. Um, so for instance, starting, starting on, the, on the left of the diagram in the pink lady, we're showing the legislative council in le le um, level one link back to the public house and that's the main secure entry of the public house with elevators and stairs leading you directly vertically. And in the back, you'll see the, the loading dock restroom blocks uh, connected. And you'll see a dotted line, meaning that yes, there's ledge there. And so we're stepping the building up and it'll get longer as you get above the ledge. So I, I don't think I'll walk you through every space. It's, it's a lot, lot to go through. Um, and it also illustrates how the, the backfill, remember that term backfill renovations, when you decant a space, it opens it up for another use. And so that is illustrated here as well. Questions? So that's the level that we enter in from, from the parking lots on mm -hmm. the ground floor. Yes. The connector is where the loading dock exists. Yes. Yep. The current loading dock. Scott? Um, I'm going to come back to controlling the water flow off of this hill. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm just wondering about um, 
how, how to do that. Um, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're gonna need to, to somehow catch the water and divert it away from the building. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and so, I mean, I guess, I guess I'm imagining, uh, a, a lot of blasting to, 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 to uh, uh, to, to make a, uh, a space behind the building where you can catch the water and, and, and have a positive slope away from, away from the building so that you're not, you know, so that the water gets, gets diverted away. Or something. I don't know. I mean, guess I'm wondering what, what what your thoughts were were about that. Yeah, it's dealing with with groundwater, which we we deal with with deep basements a lot um, and our larger structures. So it begins with a a well built foundation wall out of concrete, and then you have sealers on the outside. You have um, you have cells that capture the water in in a in the air type space so that the water doesn't get to your concrete basement. It gets to these cell systems and collects and then gets diverted out and around the side of the, the addition. When you say cells, is that like, the material or? Yeah, it's the plastic material. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, have you ever used the, uh, uh, what's that stuff called? It's a rock wool product that has oriented um, strands so that the water um, runs down through the through the rock wool. In other words, relieves the, the capillary or the, rather the hydrostatic pressure. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Have you ever used that? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Also provides a little insulation. That's getting too. way into details. Because yeah. Really well, but yes, it is. It is. It is. It is, it is uh, but long but, term that. We yeah. have but controlling that moisture is really you know kind of a key issue yeah. in this building. Right. We're very confident that we have you know, details and technology that can deal with the, the layering of that to prevent yeah. what you have now. Great, thank you. Uh, Kurt? Yes, what, what is the loading dock primarily used for? What are they, I mean, is it mostly food products or? Yeah. I'm trying to figure out how, what its primary use and how far it has to go once it's loaded. Yes, he heaviest use is the, the cafeteria. But you also have the copy room, paper products, uh, materials coming and going. Janet probably knows better than I. The mail, the mail's picked up there, mm -hmm. correct, Janet? Right, right. Any deliveries that we have, which I mean, they're, they're minimal at times, but depending. Because we we in this in this diagram, I mean, you moved it farther away from all those things, <laughs> and I'm trying to figure out how if you're loading food products, what the path is going down through, through, I guess you, do you end up going through all the public space through the connector and then? Uh, no, there's a set of elevators in the public house. So ah. that mm -hmm. sort of designates, you know, the bathrooms and the loading dock in the back away from the public space. There's currently an elevator there now. Uh, well, this is a whole new building. Yeah. I know, but currently when they deliver the food, they don't bring it up the steps to the cafeteria. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying. You don't see it because it's kind of tucked in there. And I believe it's probably an elevator in there. Is that correct? Jim? Yes. Yeah. So In our diagram, you'll see the existing elevator with an X in it uh, right across from the existing stair. Okay. No, oh, I see. On the second floor, there it would be a pretty straight shot down the connector once you get out of the elevator. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. So let's go to the second floor. This is where you're talking. Well, the house, committee rooms, and the cafeteria, the speaker's office, and bathrooms. Mm -hmm. So is there any, I don't see any reconfiguration of the cafeteria in terms of this kitchen or serving area. Is that correct? It's correct. We, we interviewed um, 
the person operating the, the cafeteria survey area. And um, they thought that within the space that they have with some equipment enhancements, they could handle uh, the traffic that we're talking about. So this is pri primarily creating seating areas in lounge spaces, uh, which is overpopulated during the busy lunch period. Well, they were only there, not to negate what they were saying, they were only there for maybe six to eight weeks because it was mm -hmm. a new operation. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, I think that was the, it was still the original people that had it. It was just different uh, staff. And that's not who was interviewed, I don't okay. think. Just yep. to be clear. Yep. There's some real functioning issues just in the delivery of the food into uh, the public and the layout of how you walk through. Yes. If you build more space in the state house, you're going to have more people coming into the state house. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have more people wanting food through the service line. You expand the state house, you're going to expand the number of people who are coming into the state house. Mm -hmm. On an average day, we probably have, Jana, what do we have? Maybe three or 400 people in the at state least. house, at least. At least, yeah. 500 maybe. Yeah. We expand the state house, you're going to be bumping six, 700 people a day easily in the building. They're going to need restrooms and they're going to need food. Just to put that out there, when we built the addition, which is where the cafeteria is now, and um, in the speaker's office and the bathrooms, what occurred over a couple of years was doubling, at least doubling what came into the state house. So just to put that out there. Yeah, they, they would like to rebuild the survey. They, they don't think the survey flows at all uh, like they would like to see it. Uh, so yeah, those are all extremely good points uh, once we move forward with the next level of design, um, th there'd be a lot to that. Uh, I've got a thought, but I don't want to put it out or not. Marcia and then Linda. Yeah, and when you get out of committee at noon and you have an hour before you're going to go on the floor and you're backed up to the card room to order to even get into the cafeteria, it's not fun. So I agree. The more room you have, the more people you're going to have. And it kind of um, hurts the legislators more than anybody because we're on a time frame. Mm -hmm. and I think there's space in the public house. We, we have another whole bathroom block stacked in in the public house uh, as well as open open areas where that servery in that kitchen could open up a, a grab and go station uh, alternate ways of providing food to everyone so I think we can accommodate uh, multiple uh, food stations within this diagram I don't I don't disagree with maybe multiple. <clears throat> food service areas, I would have concern that we have too many separate dining areas where legislators will then start branching off into their own comfort zone. And it's really important for us as we function as a legislative body to connect with our colleagues while we're eating lunch because we're talking to folks we don't normally talk to. We may hear what's happening in other committees uh, we have too many separate dining areas. People are going to branch off to their comfort zones. And you start losing the integrity of our legislative body and our work. And I am really concerned about that. The more spread out we get, which I understand we got to balance. But part of the way we do business is face-to-face -face discussions. Um, ideas are exchanged back and forth between us and it creates better legislation. And when you stay with your own group that feels and thinks the same way, you don't branch out into uh, understanding a deeper issue. Uh, Linda? 
Um, I agree 100% with the division of the uh, eating rooms. I think that is something that we should pay very close attention to in our decision making. I think that um, it can force um, division amongst uh, collaboration and how our laws come out in our discussion policy. My question, maybe Janet, is um, when there was the, say, influx of more people coming in, was it just during the legislative session or was it more during tours or over summer time? You know, what, when was that um, increase in the people? Do you know? You mean per year, in, within a year or just what year it started to happen? No, no, I'm sorry. So like, for example, you said, say, another 200 people maybe came in. Did it happen while the legislative process was going on January, February, March? Or did, oh, was it just right. more people in the summer? No, I think the main concern is the legislative time. That's when the most people were in the building. And depending on what subjects are going on, depends on if there's something going on in law and they all want to come in and have their lunch. Uh, or if there happens to be a rally, uh, it, it varies. Yeah, great, thank you. Because that's a grave concern. And, and I think we need to pay attention to that. Thank you. The other thing too, and I don't say this in a mean way at all, the number of lobbyists have really increased over time as well. That's increased quite a bit. And lobbyists are very important for us um, in that sometimes they're, they're a great resource to legislators and they need access to us and we need access to them. And a lot of that access happens in the hallways, happens in the cafeteria, happens throughout the building. And the more separated we become, the harder it's gonna be for all of us to have access. Uh, Sarah? You kind of raised something that I was, um... I really, I, I'm concerned about the, not, you know, splintering off into these smaller spaces. Um, and at the same time, I really do, I, I felt it that the last year we were in the building that um, when we would have our lunch breaks as legislators, there wasn't even a place to sit most days, like not, and it was not legislators sitting in those seats. And, and it's hard because it is, we're the people's house. We want the people, you know, when we get, after we move through what I hope is a transitional year, you know, we will have the public and it's important and the lobbyists and, and, and folks together. But, you know, I, I'm appreciating that there's giving some kind of um, uh, valve, like valves, you know, to for spaces. Cause I know that like school groups come in and they, you know, and it's wonderful when school groups come in, but like, we don't have a coat, like the, we don't have like really a space to really receive some of that, the influxes of people. So I think we're gonna have to find, um, you know, the way other, some other institutions think about visiting groups, they have spaces for those groups like coat rooms and, and uh, an area where a group can have lunch. Um, but I think, anyway, so I think it's all really, it's, it's all important. And I guess my other comment is, is that we have an opportunity here right now. We say we held on to some of the CRF funds and there's money. And then this bigger, this bigger plan, um, it, it could, we could really be at a, at a, a, an important transformational moment for the state house. So I really appreciate these plans. They're really, it's, I think it's so much clearer to me than where we were, I guess it was in August, right? Where we saw the previous report August. Yeah. So this is, I feel like we're heading in the right direction and some of these decisions will be made by other folks, but this is, I think it's encouraging. Hmm. A lot to digest here. You want to go up to level three? Yes. That's page 38. Level three really is uh, uh, that overbuild of the cafeteria linked to the public house and connector, uh, providing additional elevators, uh, stairs, bathrooms, uh, but pretty much this level is dedicated towards 
um, creating new committee rooms. And the, the best illustration of those committee rooms and how they could be set up is in the appendix on page 44 and 45. So these room sizes reflect the concepts uh, in the appendix. So there would be committee rooms in the space over the cafeteria. Yes. So there was a plan back 2006, 2007, 2008, maybe 2009 to do that floor above the cafeteria with a cantilever um, for committee rooms. Yeah, we're not illustrating the cantilever. Um, we're using the- That's some people upset. <laughs> but there was a plan out there. Yeah, 2002. That's a, yeah, but we didn't start talking about it until mm -hmm. 2005, 2006, 2007. I've listed prior studies by others on page 18 uh -huh. uh, and then relisted the studies that we did on page 19. Because it was pretty hotly debated in the institutions committees back then. And I was chair and Governor Phil Scott was chair in the Senate. And, and David Sheets brought me up to speed. <laughs> sure he did. <laughs> and that would have been back in 2005, 2006, 2007. Mm -hmm. um, Scott and then Kurt. So I guess I'm wondering about um, the number of small meeting rooms um, that you're showing. I, I know that you did some interviews with, with people, but um, I don't know. I guess I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, I'm not seeing how that really fits in personally in, in, into the legislative process that I've been involved in, which is not very long, only in my second term. But I'm, I'm, again, it seems to run counter to the idea of, of, uh, of trying to mix uh, folks from different, with different viewpoints together. Uh, anyway, I'm just wondering about the, the small meeting rooms, the number of small meeting rooms. Sure, it was, it was a real common theme across the board that yes, everyone likes to intermingle in the corridors and the nooks and the crannies and people love the cafeteria, but it's just too loud, too small. Uh, but they really did like uh, those meetings in the corridor. So that's why we have, you know, lounge seating and in the connector, open areas for that intermingling. But people did request that there are smaller rooms where one or two people could step out of the fray and just have a quiet conversation. Or there's a, a table for four people that could either be not scheduled or scheduled to have specific sessions. And we found this extremely useful in, in today's interior environments. Uh, and they're sort of best illustrated up at National Life. Uh, we redid uh, the floors at, at Vermont National Life and provided these team rooms and, and quick touchdown rooms. There, some of them are just big enough to like a telephone booth to step into and have a, a quiet phone call. So. Mm -hmm. Those are what you see in the purple sprinkled around this master plan. Yeah, um, I, I, I know they I, I did a lot of work at VEIC um, and I know that they seem to work very well there. Um, our, our office at uh, Capstone Community Action also included a lot of small rooms, but they didn't seem to work so well there. I don't know, I guess I'm just, an office environment is different from this legislative environment. Mm -hmm. uh, Scott, so I guess I'm just the, asking the question. Scott, the issue is that quite often in our legislative work, and, and maybe you didn't see it quite so much being upstairs in, when you were in energy and technology, but quite often there are situations where maybe a lobbyist wants to pull a committee member aside to explain something, and you're trying to do that while you in a quiet space and there isn't one. 
Uh, other situations, committees may have, like this committee, we had uh, Sarah and Kirk working with some of our other colleagues on water quality issues. And they would be meeting in our committee room at noontime, and then you've got other folks coming in and out. Uh, sometimes you might need a, a conversation with maybe your staff real quick. Uh, your legal staff, and you need a quiet place that you could kind of look through the different documents. And you go to the end of the hallway and the copy machine would be going and you got people coming in and out. So that's been something that's really been requested where folks can go to have, you know, a very small five minute, 10 minute, 20 minute conversation sometimes. So that's what the intent is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you had more. Just asking the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you had more questions, right? No, not anymore right now. Thanks. Okay. Kurt. Yeah, uh, Mr. Beck, could you explain the what the la the lounge seating areas? There's two of them there. I'm just trying to get a picture of what are those chairs that are permanent, or are there desks, or what what's the concept there of the outside lounge seating area outside uh, the room? Okay, in the connector, we, we see some soft chairs, soft seating, um, you know, in pairs or facing each other, just sort of a like a waiting room might be. People just sit down. Uh, maybe there's a little coffee table that they sit around. So it's, it's to be flexible. It's a concept. Okay. You know, all, all of these are, are sort of concept placeholders that have to be refined and discussed and sized appropriately but it, it really okay. is trying to create that intermingling space you don't have to be on your feet you can sit down in a soft chair sort yeah, of good. like what's out in front of the cafeteria now mm -hmm. yep. there's the couch yes. there's the couch there and some chairs and in front of the state house have their uh cabinet there that they open up sometimes at lunch but there's an area there right by the bathrooms that people sit and mingle. So, anything else, Jesse? We've got the cost estimates out there in the back. Yeah, I think uh, on page 39, there's a quick illustration because um, there are a lot of people worried about how you would add on to a historical structure, what that impact might be. And even though we're not quite there yet, we wanted to have a, a you know, a, a little illustration on how uh, it could fit very nicely in between the Pink Lady and the State House. And um, not that this is it, it's just a, a way to start the conversation and, and to show uh, the, the size uh, and impact of what we're talking about. Because there, it, once we start adding on to the sides of the state house, you kick in some other commissions. Mm -hmm. Yep. Are not legislative. Right. Connected to the city of Montpelier. Capital complex commission, the yeah. state chippo office. Uh, there's a whole. And we have a state a state house advisory committee as mm -hmm. well. In front of the state house, there's a lot of layers to this. Yep. Okay. So then when you flip over to page 40 and 41, you can, you can pair into the uh, details of each of the components, a uh, little description of the square footage involved, some of that backfill once you decant, some of the site work. And so you'll get an idea of what each of the components project cost will be. So you're saying just to build over the cafeteria would be about 7.4 million. That's your estimate. Correct, yes. And you would need a little bit of component seven because uh -huh. component seven is reserved for all of the existing equipment and mechanical spaces that are sprinkled throughout. And above that cafeteria, uh, there's an outside piece of equipment and then there's a room uh, that we'd have to slightly modify um, on the roof of the cafeteria. So that's five million. 
Yes. I believe there is 2.5 of that already in a bill some in the capital construction cost. Is that the 2.5 that uh, Catherine was talking about? It's in the budget for getting us back next year? No, I think it's a different, that's a different number. Do we have another 2.5 out there somewhere? Mm. I'm sorry, I missed which one Jesse was just talking about. 2.5, what I mentioned was from the earlier page, the estimate on the- um, On the CARES. Or the when he cost it out on page 30. Right, to bring us back. Right. January. But right. What, so Beth, Jesse just mentioned component seven on page 41 for existing state house mechanical electrical plumbing upgrades, 500, 5 million. He just mentioned there's 2.5 possibly somewhere for part of that. Did I misunderstand? What, or is it the same 2.5 that we're talking not, about? Not the same 2.5. As my understanding that BGS has already introduced this HVAC. Um, HVAC system, yes, yes, we have that. That's that's 2.5 for next year. In that's what I'm industry. referencing. Okay. We've put in half a million already. So that 5 million includes the new HVAC system. Yes. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. And we don't know what that new system will be at 2.5, could be more, could be less. And then, and then if we're gonna add on, even if we just put a, third, a floor above the cafeteria and nothing else, that HVAC system is gonna have to be designed for extra capacity. Yeah, my, my 7.4 million has some HVAC in it to do the space that we're building it doesn't have money to correct the existing systems. But I'm just putting that out to the members that right now the HVAC system that's being looked at to replace, I'm assuming they're looking at some of our current capacity with maybe some extra, but if we go down the road of deciding to put a floor above the cafeteria, we have to make sure that that new HV system has that capacity as well. Mm -hmm. the, the assessment study that the BGS is undertaking will let you know uh, the true cost of upgrading or replacing certain parts of that existing system. Mm -hmm. And there is a placeholder 2.5, um, which I bumped up to 5 million. Okay. We just did a study with engineers on the Department of Labor building, um, uh -huh. which you probably have seen. And those mix, those mechanical systems for that building were about four point two million for replacement. Okay. And the associated work with replacing those systems. And, and how that, much was that for labor again? Around four point two million. 4.2 for their, for their VH, for their- um, Completely replacing those aging systems in the DOL structure. Uh, and there's a whole engineering report and architectural report laying out all the costs of that study that's separate. So. Okay. It just gives you a, a a benchmark or an idea that um, the the mechanical electrical plumbing assessment should take place as we recommend this summer, so that you can truly know what the price tag is going to be. Mm -hmm. Could be more than five million dollars. Mm -hmm. Questions? So 
is a lot to process. <laughs> yes. A lot of um, decisions that have to be made that um, we're involved in on some level, but a lot of this decision is going to be made within leadership as well, particularly within the COVID world. Um, do you want to go on the long-term master plan schedule or not? Just to finish it up. Well, it, it, it fairly well speaks for itself. It, it's just really pointing out that uh, uh, to get any uh, project of magnitude or size, it takes a good year to two years to pass all of the leadership decisions, the architectural decisions, the permitting decisions, um, you know, getting things ready for construction. Um, there's pre-ordering of equipment and shop drawings. So that schedule kind of lays out the pathway to achieve, start achieving construction, shovel on the ground. And then uh, just, I selected if you were to do it in three phases, not phases aren't components, you can combine components, uh, but I just showed it in three phases, uh, meaning there's 18 months to achieve one or two components at a time. Uh, of course, if you did all the components at once, you might be able to shorten this timeline because everybody's mobilizing at once, but it's just a concept plan timeline to uh, further illustrate uh, what the um, approvals could look like and what the construction implementation plan might yield in three phases. Now that gets you to your three to 10 year uh, full realization of that 30 or more year investment in this master plan. Questions for Jesse? I think we're wrapping up for this. Anything else you wanted to share? The re Whoops, we do have a question here. Hang on. Uh, Sarah? It's really quick. I just want to make sure I, I understand that, you know, the historic, um, the input that, um, have we, how much input did you get about the historic? historic preservation of our state house. And I, I see in the timeline that the SHPO, I mean, that's a, um, a an important piece of the puzzle. And so is, is this, I know it's only a general concept, you know, it's a broad strokes, but is this something that um, we're gonna discover later that we can't do some parts of this or do you feel like it's pretty fully vetted? Uh, uh, we, we interviewed David Sheets as we always do with, with all these reports. And we worked very closely with him designing the uh, Waterbury State Office Complex. Uh, uh, so, you know, we've done this before <laughs> and we're very conscious about uh, historic buildings and what you can and can't do. And, and there are different approaches. There, there's different philosophies, different approaches, but we did talk in generalities about the previous master plans and what went wrong <laughs> and we uh, think we have a really good valid approach. Um, we have not talked with anybody since publishing this report on their feelings or their reactions to what we've laid out, but we, we think it's a very solid and valid approach and it does um, adjust some of the approaches of the past studies. So I, I think it works extremely well and it can be done in, in components uh, and I think the bottom line is you know, way before COVID, this building was stressed out. It was just overpopulated, stressed out with a lot of issues. And so the building hasn't changed. <laughs> mm -hmm. And in fact, I think what, in my opinion, is that uh, technology is broadening the amount of input and the amount of interest by public, both physically and just through technology and it's gonna even put more pressures on the building. So I think it's a great opportunity to solve some of those issues, both in the medium term and in the short term, whether you do one component, two, or you know, whatever you feel we can afford. 
uh, Scott? Um, yeah, following up on Sarah's question, one thought that occurred to me, and I and I don't know, and I wonder if it's even possible, is in room ten. This is I'm going back now to page twenty five, the option A. Um, would putting up some sort of temporary wall to divide room ten into two committee rooms, two temporary committee rooms? Um, be at all possible, you know, in terms of historic preservation and <laughs> and, uh, and 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 David Sheets. Mm -hmm. Room um, ten? Are you saying divide up room ten into two committee rooms? Into two committee, it's it's seven hundred square feet. Um, Pretty small committee rooms. Well, bigger than we have now. <laughs> Not by much. The but, yeah, hundred square the, feet. The the short response to that is that. Um, there's been about 10 years of work on the state house proper to restore those rooms back to their, their state. And so we really don't want to go backwards by. Right. I, I'm, I'm, thinking, making I'm, thinking, I'm thinking temporary, something that could be removed. Um, but, you know, just, that was just an idea that occurred to me in, in, or, in order to uh, avoid having to take um, maybe one of those two Big rooms, room eleven, and and the legislative lounge. Yeah, we had out of operation. We had proposed that in room twenty four, I think, in the original space study, and that wasn't received very well. <laughs> room twenty four is which room? The lounge. Legislative lounge. The lounge. And then uh, one could say, well, room eleven, you could do that as well. But right. there, you know, they've been this level of the building has been fairly well restored mm -hmm. for the most part and you hate to go backwards. I think oh, we have absolutely. to balance. I think we have to balance what are we looking at temporarily mm -hmm. yeah. versus the long term. There's two, right. Right. two separate pieces, but if you're going to tear down walls between our current committee rooms on the second and third floor, that, that feeds into a longer term plan. So do you yes. really want to tear down those walls not knowing what your long term plan is? Well, that is part of the long-term plan. Right. Um, so if you're not going to do the long-term plan, then maybe you're not going to tear down those walls, mm -hmm. which then says, okay, maybe we need 133 State Street and the 109 connector. Yeah. Well, those rooms are a lot less um, historically significant, right? Yes. In that, in that area. So. Yep. Yeah, I, I think that that's, to me, sounds like a good idea, but. Anyway, I'm just one person. <laughs> mm -hmm. So Jesse, anything else you want to share from your report? No, I think we've, we've done a good job covering all the different sections. Uh, there's quite a bit in here. Uh, and um, the interview findings, I think it's really good to, to, to dwell on that a little bit. Uh, the other piece that uh, people have asked, where do we start? What questions do we ask? And so let me find that page in here. Um, it is in page 21 in the medium term recommendations on the top of page 21, we list eight questions that we sort of asked ourselves or, or talked about in our inner groups. So it's, it's a good place to start. Um, for what, what needs to be solved uh, in that medium term. Anything else? So Jesse, I want to thank you, first off, for coming in and giving us a real thorough walkthrough of the report. And you're going before Senate Institutions Committee tomorrow afternoon. Right? Correct, yep. Um, and I also want to thank you for all the work you've done. This is your third study of the State House in a year and a half, not yes. quite two years. <laughs> yes. Um, and I also want to give kudos to Freeman French and Freeman when we went through losing the Waterbury Complex. We worked with Jesse and, and the group on the options for how we go forward after we lost the Waterbury <coughs> Complex to Irene. And that was so instrumental in helping us figure out our path forward. So there's a lot of history here with Jesse. 
good history, <laughs> a lot of history here with Freeman French Freeman. And I just want to extend on behalf of the committee to thank you for always be willing to look at our space needs and come in with your suggestions. Well, thank you very much. We really enjoy this work and we wish you luck because there's a lot of a lot ahead of you. <laughs> Yeah. And I'm always here for any questions, any discussion, anything that you need, let me know. Great. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. So bye -bye. for the, yeah, bye-bye. So for the committee, um, do you want to take a quick break and then reconvene a little bit? And maybe process a little bit of this. And um we do need to do some scheduling, so maybe have a little bit of discussion in terms of what people would want to see for scheduling. I'm gonna, we're going to start winding down our committee, so we're not going to be putting in the long hours like we were because everything's going to start shifting to the floor here pretty soon. Marsha? We're going to, uh, do you plan on recessing around noon? Yes. Then we might as well keep going. It's only 45 minutes. It's fine with me. I'm open. Do you want opinions? Yeah, I mean, and I'd like to have Janet and Kevin kind of stay on too if they can. Yeah, I'm open. I mean, okay. my opinion is let's get it retrofitted so we can go back in January and spending $50 million to build all these new additions to me isn't the right thing to do. That's my opinion. Mm -hmm. Other folks? My opinion's pretty much the same. Um, it's such a gorgeous building. And if for some reason we have no more emergency, then we've done all of this other than the IT, which is definitely necessary in our communications. So those systems definitely need help. But I wouldn't go too far into the weeds. I would just go ahead and, and let us get back as soon as we can, because we're not doing good legislation on Zoom, or I don't feel we are, it's my opinion. But anyhow, that was it. Thanks, Alice. And I can stay on. That's fine. Other folks? Scott? Um, I guess I'll say that I would be loath to, to lose both the lounge and room 11 to committee rooms. It, it just seems like uh, we, we need some large space to, to, for, for us to meet in. And those rooms are just are way too large. Scott, so are you saying on a temporary basis? Or yeah, the even, even even on a temporary basis. And I, I, I don't know what, you know, I don't know what this other solution is. But, but remember uh, that temporary basis was legislators and staff would be in the building, not the public. Mm -hmm. So you're not, so I'm, I'm just going to lay it out for folks. You're not going to have the scores of people in like you normally right. would. So there'd be more space in the, in the building that you could spread out. You could use a committee room like our room that isn't big enough as a lounge area or something on a temporary basis. I think we've got to really be clear temporary versus. Well, right. And, and there's other issues that aren't really addressed here, like uh, all of the Senate committee rooms and my old committee room, room 41, which, mm -hmm. you know, it's just. Really it, small. It, 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 Right, and and uh, and the other committee rooms that aren't aren't changed. Uh, uh, I forget what, who's who's in that room thir for our forty three. But anyway, there are a lot of committee rooms that are still not addressed in this in this in this plan. So I don't know. It's just I, I, I think I think we're we're uh, um, we're kind of planning on being able not to have to be six feet apart. I mean, that, that, that's the only way this is going to work. Um, if, if, if we have to be apart, if we, if we are in the midst of another surge um, or, um, you know, whatever variants that are, that are more, more uh, contagious and we can't uh, be in, in close proximity to one another, then we're going to have to do something way well, well beyond what's laid out here in terms of being able to meet in person. Mm -hmm. you know, we're still dealing with the unknowns. Right. So, I mean, I think there's a, there's a, a, a presumption that um, some of these rooms are going to be usable for the functions that they're being used for now. And, 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 and that presumption is 
is is based on the presumption that that uh, that things settle out and we're able to to, to be in close proximity again. Mm -hmm. Sarah. Well, I'd like to hear from so, a few more people before deciding on something, but I um, like BGS. <laughs> yeah, we're not um, making a decision. I just right, but I, I I just hope that we can be decisive because I last and, and be respectful of uh, you know pay attention to the timeline that if we don't make decisions uh, by a certain time, uh, then there are going to be consequences because um, I think. I, what I'm hearing is that people, you know, we want to be back in the state house. I would, this, this um, medium term plan um, is what I hope we can concentrate on has, um, we, we saw a similar timeline um, last uh, summer and it, where we had to make decision points and we were not able to make they, those were not made. Um, and it wasn't necessarily our committee not making those decisions. But I hope, I mean, the, I think there's a wide expectation or hope that we can come back together. But in order to do it, we have to be decisive so that IT, I mean, there's all sorts of complications with supply chain uh, mm -hmm. issues around technical technology and technical equipment um, that I think I want to be respectful to the folks who have to implement our decisions. Uh, Karen? Yeah, so it, it's hard for me to put out ideas because I feel like, like you said, we're not the decision makers in this and we're missing some of the kind of um, vision of this. But in, hear, in hearing this, I have to say there um, is the piece of hearing that, you know, that collaboration and abil ability to connect with each other has been missing this year. As a new legislator, this is all I've known. So I, and thinking that maybe it makes sense to go more towards the model that does allow more of the uh, public to come in to the building. And I realize that will spread us as legislators out more, but if we're saying that collaboration and more voices is what leads to better legislation, then uh, maybe that's something to consider. And I also feel like there is a piece of us that we have been extremely adaptive and flexible this year. We're, everybody in our state and our country is, and I'm kind of like, we can do whatever is needed for another year. Um, I appreciate getting this presentation in the context of what might be potential um, capital projects in the future for the state house that we might want to consider. Like if we're making these changes, how does it impact what we might do down the road? So I guess those are some of my thoughts. Again, I think we could land in all different ways and I feel like we could get through next year However, like that's that's the world we're in right now. It's gonna to be tough doing next year on Zoom. It's gonna to be tough. Um, other thoughts? Yeah, we'll lose a lot of legislators too. Yeah, you're gonna. It's gonna destroy the legislative body. Yeah. I'm gonna be blunt. It's gonna destroy us. This is okay for one year, but even that is pretty tenuous right now. Because there's a lot of things happening that are not good. And it may not all be obvious, but people are tired. They're worn out. Our staff are working 24-7. Um, legislators, there's anticipation of us being on all the time. And we don't know each other. That's the biggest piece. We don't know each other. Yeah, that's huge. It's not good. So there's some real, there's some real cultural issues that are occurring and people, the way you learn a legislative process is working with your colleagues in the building and the legislative process is not, um, a lot of members don't know the legislative process and who's involved and who's sitting in what committees and who's who in the building and how what one legislator says may have dramatic impact on the whole body. And you don't feel that when you're sitting home. Or one um, person's position really can change where other legislators go in their positions. And that's not obvious to folks in Zoom or sitting back home. It's obvious to us veterans. 
but for folks who haven't been been there for very long and don't know the people. Um, it's a very different interpretation. So, and, and I believe strongly in our General Assembly and our legislative branch. And I value the work that we do and I see it um, operating on a very different level that is not sustainable for who we are as Vermont legislators in our General Assembly. So that's my soapbox. Uh, Michael? Yes, I'm with you, Alice. I mean, I've, uh, I'm new to this process, but I've been a selectman in my town, which is a smaller scale piece of politics for 11 years. And I can tell you just from doing those in Zoom and then doing this in Zoom, a lot of bad things happen. I think we, it's sad when you have to relegate your thoughts, opinions, and whatever of people relegated to a little square that you're looking at them um, because you miss tons of things, including body language, side discussions that you would have that you normally can't have here. Uh, we are missing out hugely. And I agree with you. I think there's a lot of bad stuff going on and I can't put my finger on all of it. I have thoughts and we all have thoughts on that. And when I say bad, I don't mean horrific, but I mean, I just don't think it's, it's optimal. I hope the governor lifts everything like he's projecting on the, the 4th of July ish and we get back to, to normal operations. Um, you know, the vaccine thing, you know, it, that's a personal choice if somebody chooses not to or can't for health reasons, that's understandable. Um, but that would be a personal choice. And maybe we have to make some accommodations for folks like that. But I personally chose to go get one. I think that we are remiss to not go back to situation normal as soon as we possibly can. And I would kind of piggyback on something what Karen said is that uh, maybe, you know, and I hate to use the words kick the can down the road, but I think it might give us a little bit of room to have some flexibility with this because it's an awful lot of money too. Um, to do some of these things, but do we need some modernization? Quite possibly, but uh, again, my two cents. Thanks. So Karen and then Marcia. Yes, I just wanted to make sure because I know Chair Emmons, you followed up with, I, I am not saying I'm for staying on Zoom <laughs> for, <Sure>. forever. <laughs> that was not it's my intention. Okay. Zoom's a backup, but not so I want to make it clear that is not what I'm promoting. I, I see that we are ahead of that and we're going in a different direction. Um, so just want to be on the record being clear with that. I'm happy for us to come back. I do get on my soapboxes. I, I just have so much belief in the General Assembly and the work that we do. So go ahead, Karen. I interrupted you. No, I just wanted to make sure because I know this is this is one of the things of being on Zoom, right? You miss some of the connection, and it's like we have to raise our hand to you know talk about how it is. And so I just want to make it clear, put it on record now that we're being taped on everything. <laughs> I am for being in person. Right, but just wait until you all we all get back on the floor and you have to report a bill. You have to stand up and hold <laughs> a microphone, and the rest of us are seated. And the only way you get recognized to speak is if you stand up. So you could have five people standing up at once and this <laughs> only recognizes one. So it's not raising your hand. It's not raising a blue hand. <laughs> it's not staying seated. So that will be a big shift. It's just turning around and being able to speak to the person next to you. I mean, that's, that's really what we really, really miss. Everybody's ideas and putting them all together and coming up with a great solution. And we can't do that on Zoom. My husband doesn't have any input, thank you very much. He's the only one I can turn around and talk to. Right, and they don't understand what we're doing. They say, no, he got so upset right. over the electric bicycle that I said, I'm not talking to you about anything. <laughs> Marsha? Yeah, and Karen, and we're all staring at you when you stand up to address. Yeah, that's but true. But Alice, I just want to say, uh, make a little room on your soapbox because I'm with you. <laughs> Absolutely. You said everything, just how we feel. Yeah, I just don't want to see us lose. And Janet, what do you think of having uh, more, more room <laughs> so you have a couple, 300, 400 extra people coming in every day? 
<laughs> well, I'm, I'm of a mix because right now we do struggle like in the lobby itself when we have a large group coming in, you know, the kids come in and they're excited and, you know, then I have to go out and say, please be quiet, please be quiet. And then senators will come out of their rooms and saying, you've got to keep people quiet. And there's <laughs> really just I'm like my hands are tied. I can't make everybody happy. Uh, so some little parts of it I would like you know, from this new report. I know that the legislature also, it's hard to give to themselves, you know, when so many people are struggling in the state and in the community, and we're going to say, hey, well, let's make this easier on us as legislators. Um, you know, another big component is staff, and we increase our staff here working for you, and, you know, we have to provide them with a, a, a good working space. Um, you know, I'm not in charge of that totally, but you know, and from my perspective, the, the HVAC system is still an issue in regular times, as you know. Um, right. Scott, you were in, were you in uh, Ways of Mean, or what was your former committee? Mine, I was in Judiciary. Yeah, and Scott, you were. I was in Energy was Technology. In tech. Yeah, so you know that that room is so small. And, oh, yeah. Yeah. That, and we yeah. still do have problems. I mean, people, uh, they, you know, it's too hot, it's too cold, it's this right. person's, uh, the exhaust is coming in the building, and so. Yeah, there you know, are some reparations to be made, but I don't think that we need to make the drastic ones in the, in, in the add-on, as I said before. Right. But I know that you're, you as Sergeant at Arms are in charge of a lot, and it's just going to enhance your job hugely. <laughs> And I think you do a great job. Um, thank you, Representative. Sarah? Well, I just, you know, I just wanted to say, you know, J Janet, it's so great to hear your perspective on all this, because as a sar our sergeant at arms, you really, I feel like you take care of our, the people's house for all of us. Um, and I, so I, I would, you know, we all want to come back as legislators. And I think, I think the public, you know, in the future, we want to, figure out how the public can come back. And I think we have to do something to ease up the, the pressures on our building. Cause hearing you talk about how you have to quiet kids, like so the senators can like have their meeting downstairs. It's like, you know, it's, that's the balance I think that we need to find, you know, like we, we talk about this, the state house as being a museum um, and, you know, the visitorship during, and that we're a living museum, you know, doing our work while people are visiting. And I think, there are just a couple of things that we really are missing in that, in, in that. And I'm hoping that, you know, I don't want to be, I want to be really responsible about the money. We don't know about the money piece beyond the immediate needs. And, but if there is an opportunity um, with some of the federal funds that are going to be coming into the state, if some of them can be used to think about a 10 year plan, I think we'd be making a mistake not to be open to that idea. So I know we have the decision point. Alice, tell me, like, you know, we can make a decision of, um, about the immediate, you know, about Jan returning in January, but there are some pieces of the long-term plan that are part of, of that, correct? Like, or- If you tear down a couple walls and you lose some committee rooms and you do that temporarily, it's yeah, it's temporary. permanent. Then that's, be, that's not temporary. Yeah, so we have to think about that. That's what I'm. Um, so anyway, it's just it's really. I'm trying to be optimistic about it that we have an opportunity before us, and to like that. I think that this this um, this report that um, Freeman French and Freeman put before us is really helps us all visualize um, the spaces and the options before us. So I know we'll be. Danger. I'm eager to hear from BGS and to hear a little bit more about the historic preservation piece, because I know with other projects, if those are not considered up front, you can run into some real problems. And I would hate to see that an expense, and I'd hate to see that happen. Mm -hmm. And I think Sarah said it well, it's a balance that we need to look at for that. And we will be getting in BGS for sure on this. I'm pretty sure they probably were listening in on YouTube this morning. Um, 
I mean, these aren't going to be easy decisions and they're not going to be made just in our committee. Oh. The long-term piece will be more in our committee, but for the interim may not be. We, you know, we just don't know. We just don't know. So Scott? Um, well, I think it makes all kinds of sense to follow up with the original, what apparently is the original plan to put another floor on top of the cafeteria. That would, that would give us a lot more space. Um, and so keep keeping that and that at least that part in mind um, when we're thinking about the short or the medium term plan seems to make sense to me. I don't know about the, uh, the other addition. I certainly would not want to see a glass box attached to the state house personally, but <laughs> just to, just as an aside. Even to put a floor on top of the cafeteria is a heavy lift. Right, right, but it makes it, it's it's a it's a it's a sensible place to do it, and uh, but that's not an easy lift in right. the building. Right, sure. That's a heavy lift. Just that alone, maybe a heavy <laughs> lift for that. So we'll schedule in BGS on that. Anything else? We're, I'd like to do some scheduling. Um, I think we've got a full time. We don't have anything on the schedule for this afternoon. Um, I, we may have somewhat of a hour and a half to two hour floor time. So I would say let's not meet this afternoon. Let's be on hold for tomorrow to see what happens after the floor. Um, maybe we could get, if we have time, we could get BGS in tomorrow after the floor to talk about this. If we have time, we're still waiting for the capital bill to come back. Um, I know Kurt wants us to talk about his parole board bill. Um, so we can have a conversation about that next week. Any other things that folks might be interested? I'm really looking at, I don't think we need our full times on Wednesday and Thursday mornings. Um, and I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure what the floor schedule is gonna be next week. Sometimes as we get towards the end of the session, we meet in the mornings on the floor. So I don't know when we're gonna start making that shift. Next week's the first week of May, we got two to three more weeks left. So committees are gonna be winding down. Um, thoughts at all? We'll get in BGS. We should get in uh, historic preservation on this and who knows where the decisions are going to be made, at least on the temporary piece. And then we'll have our capital bill next week back here. So, Kurt? Uh, if possible, I'd, I'd like to know a little bit more about the um, inspection process for the uh, Adirondack, with, just to feel better that who what they would actually be looking for when they're doing it. You know, there were those people who were going to inspect it before it goes in. That's a and R. Yeah, it would, be, it would be good to get some testimony from them, but it's not essential. Okay. I don't think I, that, that issue is probably not going to be a crucial decision by us right away. I think it's kind of out of our hands at this point. It's in the yeah. courts. It's in the courts. And I know that House Naturals looking at the language about the rules in the bill. They're gonna be looking at that tomorrow afternoon. You so, know, I noticed nobody mentioned the uh, Marble Palace and all this. Uh, I the, know. Uh, the, the, we lost a Senator who was adamant about keeping it. So maybe uh, people would be a little more open to adjusting that space. We didn't get into the basement. Who was the Senator? I think Rogers really wanted to keep it. Oh, yeah, Rogers. Yeah. Well, the issue there, it's not ADA accessible. That's part of the problem. Yeah, but I just wanted to use it for server space to yeah. expand the. I think IT Kevin, stuff, <laughs> Kevin will chime in on that. I think that gives him heart palpitations. <laughs> oh, okay. It's a, it's a pretty there, small there he is, thing. There anyway. he is. What's the issue there in terms of uh, moisture, or is it in terms of. Um, flood <laughs> i don't there know are Kevin. so many problems with having uh <laughs> it equipment core it equipment in the basement um it's pest control it's moisture it's uh climate control from heat heating and cooling 
Um, it's static issues, believe it or not. There, there are so many different issues uh, oh, being wow. in the current space that we're in. <laughs> it's uh, an electric we'll, fence like Bob Helm. <laughs> it, it's, there, there are a lot of challenges and, and we're desperately, desperately in need of a proper facility uh, mm -hmm. for this equipment. Okay, that, then, then I'll throw that idea out. <laughs> so this is one reason we didn't want to sell the Baldwin buildings because we just don't know what spaces are going to be needed. And that's what contributed to us saying, no, we're not ready yet. Eventually we might be, but right now there's too many things up in the air in terms of our space needs. Within COVID, number one, and our uh, IT needs and well, regular building needs. Was, we, I, we didn't ask Jesse about this, but was there any uh, analysis of, of using some of those buildings for, for committee rooms? You're not going to get committee rooms out of the state house on a permanent basis. No, no, I don't mean permanent, but I'm thinking. I don't think you could do that because they're not ADA accessible. Uh. And some members would need more accessibility, just members. Right. Yeah. Well, even even just walking across the ice, I, I've... yeah, that that is, Madam Chair. We didn't discuss that, but we've got the different. If option B has people all over the place, one of our big concerns is getting people back and forth safely. You know, what will that take? How will that work? And uh, I see Representative Bachelor Crash, I call her, is comment is smiling and yaying about that. <laughs> so. See, this is what a lot of folks being on Zoom, you know, if I ran into the, the new members here that I didn't serve with previously, I don't know if I'd recognize you on the street. You probably wouldn't recognize me. You know, I mean, that's the level that we're at. So we don't have the concept of how mobility impacts our whole body in terms of some people we think are very mobile. And once you meet them, you realize maybe they have some mobility issues. You know, they may have some breathing issues. They may have circulation issues. You know, all sorts Alice, of things. Alice, I'd recognize your voice anywhere. Oh, jeez. <laughs> you're busted. Huh? I'll shut up. I says, you're busted. <laughs> busted. Yeah. But that's the level that we're at. We only know somebody from their shoulders up. It's like going to the grocery store with everybody with masks on. Sometimes you don't even recognize who's there. They it's... don't even recognize me from the shoulders up. <laughs> <laughs> now that's very it's true. So you're not on screen. And you don't know us, some of us. So let's call it a wrap for this morning, for today. Um, we're going to have a long time on the floor. I'd like Mary, Sarah, and I to come together at some point. Um, can we take a quick 20 minute lunch and come in with Phil at noon for a few minutes? It's not gonna take long. Is that, does that could work? It, could, could it be a couple of minutes after, um, like 10 after I've got someone who's coming to pick something up at the house just so that I'm not in the middle of that, if that's possible. So like five after 12 or 10 after 12, is that possible? That's possible because I don't think we're going to have more than a few minutes to work with Phil. Okay. Be okay. Because I know uh, I have a commitment at 1230. Okay. Or do you want to do it right now? Uh -huh. We could do it right now. Why don't we do that now? Okay. That, that would be terrific. Can I just and say I'm thank you, Janet? Thank you very, very much. Oh, I appreciate it. And it's so nice to see all of you. I do miss you. I, we, we don't miss all the problems that you all bring to us. <laughs> Heck no. We won't go there. We won't no, decide. No, that. come on, Janet. Come on. <laughs> Janet, I I make you, we make your life interesting. I know. And Janet, I do I miss Brian the Pages Donuts. I know. I know. And I just wanted to say, Representative uh, Sullivan, I did appreciate your comments about the public and the constitutional right of everyone. That, you know, that's also a big concern. And I know that's a totally concern of, of the, the legislature in general to allow the people's house to be the people's house. So uh, I just want to put that out there that that is a goal. So mm -hmm. thank thanks. you. And thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. You guys, schedule. we'll leave Bye. so you guys can.
party. Bye. <laughs> So let's zoom, let's uh, zoom off YouTube and then we'll do scheduling here.